Hey, what's going on guys? Today we're going to be doing a sort of book review, taking a look at this book here. The title is Plamo Hajimimasu. It is from a Japanese YouTuber. She's right here on the cover, Kosaka Kino. A pretty cool YouTube channel, definitely makes a ton of videos there and there's a lot more of that you'll see in the inside of this book. Uh, but definitely check it out if you have a high tolerance for Japanese fake kawaii girl voice, because there's a lot of that. The English title is Improve Your Plamo Skills with Ease, and that's what this book is all about. It's a very beginner book, which is great if you're a beginner. And even if you're not a beginner, there's some really interesting kind of tips and techniques in here that you might find of use. So it's cool if you've basically seen some of my old tutorials or work in progress videos, basically everything that I've ever shared on my channel about like any sort of like beginner techniques and steps and things like that, it's all condensed into one convenient book. The only problem is that it's all in Japanese, but I'm gonna go through it here with you guys in this video and we'll kind of take a look at the majority of the stuff that's in here. And of course, if you guys do decide to pick it up for yourself, uh, it's really convenient to just use a translator app on your phone if there's like a, a picture with some text below it that you want to know exactly what the text says. You can just snap a picture with your phone and you can just use a translation app to translate that and it should work pretty easily. But let's go ahead and get into it. Let's take a look at the book. All right, so like I said, I do really like the presentation of this book. Very cute, just the styling of it. This is just a little cover here on the outside. You got all sorts of very familiar Plamo tools and things. Got a little Mechatro guy here on the back. List price for this, so it's 1,700 yen, so not too bad. Should cost you around 15, 20 bucks around there for this book. And as you can see, it's like a smaller size, but it's relatively thick. And this is also just a cover here with a little bio there for Kosaka Kino here in the back. And I really actually like this, just you know, inside, I like the main cover as well is really quite nice. I'm just gonna put those off to the side for now. But there is the book on the inside. We'll get into the contents. Again, there's the YouTuber who made this book. There's a little letter from her here at the start, um, kind of five points, which aren't really too pertinent to what's actually covered in the book. Here is the actual contents, and we'll see these as we're going through the book. So there's kind of five main chapters to the book, and the first one is basics of plastic models. So obviously going to be our most basic things going through here, starting off with like the tools, nippers, sanding paper, uh, pin set, otherwise known as tweezers, and here's one thing that they'll use throughout the book, uh, OK and NG, NG, I'm assuming just standing for not good. And the point here, I had to check this because I wanted to check what exactly was pointing out about the tweezers here, is that they're, they're supposed to align. If your tweezers aren't aligned, then it's not gonna work well for you, but that seems kind of common sense. But anyway, this is the most beginner of beginner stages of the book here, so some Q-tips, uh, toothpicks, a uh, hobby knife or design knife, and then some cement, we got uh, regular Tamiya cement and then Mr. Cement SP. You could also use like Tamiya extra thin cement or there's other different kinds of cement. So just having some glue for most like Bandai uh, snap kit models, especially Gunpla, you mostly don't need cement as you guys are probably well aware. But if you're working on other stuff with tank models or anything like that, then usually you are gonna need some cement. Next bit here is just about how to read the manuals, just a little kind of tip about some of the symbols used commonly in Bandai manuals. Again, this is all stuff you guys should be, even if you're very new to the hobby, you should be at least familiar with some of this stuff. Just a little thing here about how to cut the parts, and we'll see this here, a warning, just to make sure you're cutting uh, in the right spot on different pieces. Sometimes it's hard to tell where is the actual gate and then what's actually part of the piece. So just make sure you pay attention when you're cutting things not to cut where you're not supposed to. I'm sure we've all had that happen to us where we cut uh, the actual part instead of cutting where we were supposed to cut from the runner. So just make sure you pay attention to that. Cut a little bit off, then cut some more off with your nippers and then sand it down or use it with a hobby knife. So exactly how I've just recently talked about in a couple of videos about how to remove nubs there. Placing sticker decals with just your tweezers and then using a Q-tip or and or a toothpick, but just make sure, I would not recommend using a very sharp toothpick, make sure it's like a little bit dull. It's kind of better for working stickers into crevasses and things like that. Anyway, there's your assembled HG Mazinger kit. All right, just kind of moving along, this is all like the most basic stuff here. Uh, water slide decals, which I'm kind of a little bit surprised that the water slide decals are covered in the very basic stage here at the front, because I know that, at least for me, they seem pretty easy, but I know for a lot of people, they don't really consider water slide decals to be quite this much a beginner thing as in like one of the first things you learn, but they are actually quite easy. I know some people do feel kind of nervous about 
uh, using water slide decals if you're kind of new to the hobby, but honestly, you shouldn't feel that way. They're very easy. Um, and you can get to using them very easily. You don't even have to paint. Here's some tips about dealing with like the little nub marks that are left over. Sometimes like the little white bits left over. So like we talked about recently, again, uh, scratching with your nail, using some glue, using like a, a marker, uh, just sanding, using some paint remover uh, for easy ways. Or you can also order new parts is a thing that it's pointing out for you here, but that's only if you live in Japan, you can order replacement parts. Uh, and then this is the kind of thing that at, I think it's at the end or near the end anyway Yeah, near the end of each uh, chapter of the book of each of the five chapters There's uh, QR codes which are linked to some different videos So these would be like videos related to some of the stuff that's covered in this first chapter You can check out kind of more information uh, by checking out some of these videos So that's a very clever uh, thing to include in the book Direct links for people to really easily find some more video references for that very cool idea I think, and then here's just a look at some tools and paints and stuff. Okay, so easy enough. Chapter two is easy and beautiful coloring, so painting, basically. Uh, but it's gonna start off with actually just panel lining, going through a few different ways to panel line. First of all, using a shop pencil or mechanical pencil, mechanical pencil at an eraser, when actually over here, that actually doesn't look like a mechanical pencil. That looks more like it's actually a pen, but either way. Uh, mechanical pencil, yes, something that you can use. I've seen it recommended many times in different Japanese modeling uh, books and videos and things like that, but I actually don't really see many people outside of Japan using mechanical pencil all that much. Seems like one of those things that uh, they're into in Japan, but outside of Japan, people just you normally tend to stick with pens, which is the next one here. So this would be just like your standard marker pen here, which you can use. Also, you can use an eraser for that or a design knife to kind of scratch away that, uh, depending on the color and depending on how uh, careful you are with that. But uh, obviously a much more common way to do your pen aligning is of course just using actual enamel paint or like the Tamiya accent color, which is just the same thing. But in this case, she's using uh, Gaia enamel, which I haven't really worked with all that much, to be honest. I have a, some Gaia enamel paints and I've used them a little bit, but not ever really used them for pen aligning. But this is what you can do. Of course, just with uh, enamel paints, it kind of works the best. Just need some enamel paint and it's corresponding thinner. Uh, you stir it up in a little cup or a dish or something, get it thinned down, apply it with a brush, and then wipe it away with a Q-tip that's wetted with thinner is the best way to go. So here's just kind of showing some different colors. And this is a really good way to do your panel lining because you're very free to use, you know, enamel colors are available in many, many colors. Uh, so you can do panel lining in blue, yellow, pink, red, whatever color of the rainbow you could possibly want. So a very convenient way to do that. Uh, if you're just using like the Tamiya accent color, which are just like kind of the ready mixed ones, those are very convenient, but they're only available in four, five, six colors maybe, and probably commonly only two or three colors maybe very commonly available. All right, now getting into painting details here with the marker, paint markers. So uh, important step to when you're first using the paint marker, maybe let some paint out on, not on the part straight away, put it on something else, just like extra little bit of runner, just to make sure you're getting like a, a good flow first, then put it on the mark, uh, put it on the piece. And I've talked about this before, not to do this directly, let it out into a little dish or something and use a paintbrush to do this. But you know, depending on the application, sometimes just using the marker can work okay. But uh, for more precision, I would recommend using a paintbrush. Uh, using it to fill in little details and then if you're filling in little details and you have a little bit kind of left over on the edge this is something i've also talked about before in past videos using a knife to then just kind of very carefully scrape around the edges to clean up your kind of extra paint that you have around the edges of little details and you can do that for little bits like this for making uh your petit trits kits which are very fun little kits, so I would highly recommend them. Another little tip here for doing your spray uh, top coat is you can use what looks like, I think she's using some double-sided tape there. You could also maybe just use like a little bit of hot glue or something would actually work quite easily just on top of a paint bottle. It's just very easy. Just if you're painting or oh, just want to spray some top coat on this little like chick, attach that some way just kind of temporarily onto the top of a paint bottle. That way you can just hold on to that very easily and then spray it with your spray top coat. Easy peasy. You can also do it inside without a spray booth. Is with a spray booth. This is just inside without a spray booth. Just putting some newspapers in like the corner of the room. Would not really recommend that either because then when you're spraying, it's all gonna, it's all just bouncing off the wall and coming back at you. So you're just gonna be getting a bunch of spray just flying around uh, in your face. So definitely the better way to do that would be just do it outside. 
Uh, but yeah, just make sure you're taking precautions, right? So here's a little bit about uh, different top coats. So gloss, semi-gloss, and matte. Obviously, you're gonna get some different finishes with those and they're all available in spray can type. Now, another interesting technique here that I'm kind of surprised is kind of this early on in the book, but this is how to make a marble effect We're using a couple different colors, using black, silver, and clear blue, which are available in spray can, but obviously this is easier to do if you're using this uh, actual airbrush, but it depends on the technique because the way that she does it here in this book is actually a little bit different from how I've seen it done in the past. So first of all, you just take your piece and spray it black. And then what she does is then spray the silver onto like the saran wrap or like a cooking, uh, I don't know what you guys call it. Saran wrap is what I know it as. It was just like this, uh, I don't know. Anyway, this, that, uh, anyway, <laughs> that wrap. Uh, so she's spraying it onto the wrap and then dabbing it onto the parts, uh, onto the black painted part just with the wrap. How, another way that I've seen it done is to just spray the silver directly on the part and then put the wrap on there But then you have to get the wrap on while the silver paint is still wet And if you're using an airbrush, that's probably not gonna work because by the time you spray all the silver It dries really fast and when you put the saran uh, wrap on there, it's probably gonna be mostly dry by that time so Depending on how you're painting that might not work I know spray paint using uh, out of the spray can is also it's the same paint lacquer paint that you would use out of an airbrush but it's usually a lot more is coming out of the spray can so it doesn't quite dry quite as fast so if you're using spray cans you might try that technique just spray the silver on there then put the wrap on then take it off really quickly and it kind of creates a similar effect but or you could try it like this spray it on the wrap and then just dab it on there basically similar to similar to like sponge chipping but just with wrap and we'll see some sponge chipping later on but then after that, then spray your clear blue over the top and you've got a pretty easy marble effect, which is pretty convincing. And this is just like the most basic way to do that. There's other ways to do this that kind of can give you some nicer results. This is just a really simple way to do that, which is works out pretty well, it looks like. Now this one, uh, hydro dipping, is something I've tried before and experimented with, not ever on camera because I could never really get it to work very well. But it's worth a try because the, the, the tools and things that you need to do it are very cheap. You can just get some very cheap uh, fingernail polish just from like the dollar store or 100 yen store or whatever you guys have around you. That's kind of the equivalent of that. You just need some sort of container. You can use like an old food container. Just make sure that you clean it well. So like if it was like a food delivery container, make sure you wash it so that there's no like oil in it left over. But just some sort of container filled with water. Uh, drop some fingernail polish paint in there. And I think you can also use enamel paint as well, but you, again, just it's something that you just kind of have to experiment with. Just drop a bunch in there uh, and you can kind of swirl it around a little bit with a toothpick or something uh, and then just dip your part in carefully and you know then you have to kind of remove the paint around so then when you pull the part back out you're not getting paint like more paint on it. So dip it in kind of remove a little bit of the paint off the surface of the water then pull the part out and it should look ideally kind of cool like that but again it's something you just kind of have to experiment with and depending on like the shape of the part it might not work out that well and just kind of it takes some experimenting I think like to get it to be working very well uh, all right then we got a different kind of way of doing like a painting marble effect and this is something that I've also tried with kind of limited success but with this one again you're just gonna to want to paint black first or just kind of depending on what colors you want it to be but typically you would want to paint black first then get some cotton stretch it out kind of wrap the cotton around the part and tape it off or something just so it's uh, held around the part then spray your secondary color over the top of that and it creates a marble effect like this now this one is show demonstrating a good reason why it's kind of difficult to do because you can see it's not consistent over the part it looks nice on the raised areas but on the recessed areas it's kind of more fuzzy and not as well defined so you just kind of have to do it carefully and again it's something that you can just experiment with and this is the great thing about having leftover parts in your kit so if you have a kit a master grade high grade or whatever you have some leftover parts uh, this you keep those leftover parts because you can use them for trying out techniques like this like the hydro dipping and like this uh, test it out on just leftover parts and just see how it works get a hang of it uh, and then do it on you know whatever kit you're working on but again it's a pretty simple technique uh, that just takes some experimenting to get it right uh, here's more links to some more videos and a picture of her at home i would guess that's probably her home and then we can get on into chapter three Chapter 3 is going to cover how to make real weathering, so then how to basically make your kits a little bit more realistic with some different things. So the first thing it's going to cover is sponge chipping. The thing that everyone kind of uh, tries out first when you're trying your weathering, chipping in some way, shape, or form. Doing it with a sponge is a great way to get a 
kind of more realistic effect, right? So here it's just recommending either acrylic paints uh, or oil paints and a sponge. So you just cut a piece of sponge, uh, put some paint out just on uh, paper or something like that, whatever. Dip your sponge in the paint and then very important to dip, uh, like dab your sponge onto a paper towel. Get as much paint off, ideally kind of get a lot of the paint off because when you touch to the paint, you're gonna have a lot of paint in the sponge. Then you need to put it on the paper towel, get some paint off of there so you have just a little bit of paint actually on the sponge. So when you're applying that to the part, you're not putting on too much paint. And what you wanna do is, is build it up. So you just put a little bit on and you can just kind of repeat and repeat and build it up slowly until you get it to the level that you want. And so here's some example of that on a tank kit there. And you can see that sponge painting worked out quite nicely, but there's definitely some other techniques going on in this one that are not covered so this is not all just done with the sponge chipping but you guys get the idea for that uh, here it is on a truck model and on a downboard model here trying some different colors so this is also using a couple different colors like a darker gray or black color and then like a lighter gray or silvery kind of color in there as well and this one obviously using a, a number of different colors and so yeah using a couple of different colors is also another way to make it more realistic if you're only doing it with one color it's just not going to look quite as realistic so there's a couple of different sponge kind of tools that you can use but basically any kind of sponge should work pretty well for that. Now for this technique is using the Mr. Weathering color here, uh, which from, are from Mr. Color, so another very useful tool to have. With these, basically you just kind of paint them onto the kit and then just wipe it off and you can use the Mr. Weathering solvent and or just like tissue, Kleenex or whatever, you, to just kind of wipe it off to whatever degree that you need, depending on how dirty you want it to be ultimately. Yeah, it's a pretty simple, basically solvent-based uh, paint that you basically just paint on there and then just remove, and then it will fill in your panel lines and also give you uh, a kind of, it'll basically tint, whether you're doing it directly on the plastic or onto a painted part, it will give you a little bit of filtering as well too, which will basically just create a very thin uh, layer of color on top of whatever you're applying it onto. And then a dry brushing. So this, in this case, she's just using some silver and a brush. So again, just take a little bit of paint on the brush and then brush off the paint as much as you can onto a paper towel. So brush it off, brush it off until there's barely any paint on there and then apply it to the part. And again, you're just gonna want to just do it as little as possible and just build it up. Uh, do it a couple times until you get it built up to the level that you want. Um, then using pastels. This is something I've never really dealt too much with uh, getting into pastels, but important step you're going to want to do first is make sure you have a matte top coat on the part so that you, basically what you want to do is if it's too glossy, uh, the pastels basically have nothing to grip onto. Then when you're putting the pastels, which is basically just like a fine powder onto there, and if it's just a glossy surface, it's just going to slide off. So you need that kind of rough surface that's created by the matte top coat in order for your pastels to actually stick onto where you're applying them onto. So you can use a Q-tip or you can use like a makeup ap applicator sponge kind of thing is what a lot of people use as well. So you just get your powder, because pastels usually come in like a stick form like this, like chalk sort of. Uh, just grind that a little bit just to get some of the fine powder, apply it onto the part, and there you go. <laughs> You've got like a colored dusty effect, basically to make it look more, re more realistic. All right, so here's some more videos about basics of weathering, I suppose, and an outdoor shot there firing her toy gun and uh, part four which is quite interesting is how to use 100 yen items this is like just stuff from the dollar store stuff that you can get for very cheap that can be useful tools for the hobby so a very cool chapter here that I'm glad to see in a book like this and something that I've definitely been planning on making a bunch of videos related to this kind of thing uh, for a long time I've got like a box full of stuff that's like from just from the dollar store that I've been meaning to make into just like mini tutorials how to use stuff from the dollar store. Uh, that'll be coming in the future at some point. But yeah, just like dollar store nippers works totally fine. Dollar store brushes, uh, dollar store tweezers, masking tape, all this stuff you should be able to get like at the dollar store, 100 yen store, Daiso, like I said, whatever. Uh, sandpaper, sanding sponges. These type of sanding sponges, these are like hobby sanding sponges. So I don't think at least in America, or I don't know, maybe in Japan you can, but I've never seen those in the dollar store. Uh, sanding sticks also, I'm not sure about that. If you can find those in the hobby store, you'd be lucky, but you should be able to find those like buffing uh, sanding sponges that are like meant for nails, nail art and use like that. You can also use some eyeshadow here, and there's like the applicator sponge I was talking about uh, for 
your pastels, like instead of pastels, you can use these if you can find them like in the right color. But eyeshadow, you can usually you can find in like a lot of different colors, especially these kind of earthy tones could be quite useful. Uh, and this, uh, just uh, for clips for like instead of like an alligator clip or something, I guess, something like that. And these type of items, these are the ones that are available probably in Japan. I'm not sure how readily available these are going to be in other countries at like different dollar stores, but like miniature items, stuff for like just making miniature stuff. So these like miniature blocks, miniature lockers, miniature pipes, these type of things. I don't know how actually readily those are available. You might be able to find other things like this that you can use for just making like a little diorama. Uh, this is kind of felt to use like for grass or these uh, like pieces of wallpaper or something like that that you can use for making like a uh, base or something for like the wood floor of a base or something uh, and then here is about using some like mirror powder or any kind of like pigment powder and you should be able to find these at like dollar stores as well just meant for nail art with pigment powder and then just with mixing it in with some clear paint you can also do it in a couple different this is something you can do it in a couple different ways but this is what they show at least in this book mixing it with uh, clear uh, this would be gloss clear from Gaia mix it together and you can spray it uh, out of an airbrush to make a metallic effect. In this case, she's spraying it onto some black spoons, but you get the idea. Kind of interesting why she didn't spray this onto like a Mechatrol kit or something, some different actual parts of a kit, but just you can see the effect there on the black spoons just using those pigment powders, which, yeah, are, again, are something you usually can find for pretty cheap. All right, then making some simple bases using some readily available things. This asphalt, as we'll see here on the next page, you can make asphalt surface very easily using just corkboard. So just get some corkboard, masking tape, and some paint. Just paint directly onto the corkboard. Use some masking tape to make like your street lines or make like this bicycle marking there on the street. Just cut it out of a piece of paper, just tape it down to the asphalt, the painted asphalt base there. And just use a sponge to apply that white paint and very simply can make a little road. Very easy. And then just using some other different items, glue, corkboard, uh, clay, paint, and some like wood chips and things like that that you can get. Usually they'd be like in the gardening section, I believe, of your uh, dollar store or whatever. So clay to make some dirt on the base, lay some kind of wood chips and stuff on there to sort of look like wood or and or rocks, uh, paint them up accordingly. And you can also add some little foliage bits in there if you can find that, it should be pretty simple. And again, it's not gonna be like the best looking diorama and it all just depends on how you, I mean, you could definitely make it look very convincing, but I mean, these are just uh, using very basic, easily available, I suppose, probably, hopefully, easily available items to make a pretty simple base and it looks pretty good. There you go. Um, this one is something I've never actually really seen these or I've never really seen these actually used very much as far as I know but like these sort of clear kind of gel balls I guess which are like she's pouring into this kind of container and I guess you like add water and it melts them into something that will look like that I don't know I've never really seen that done before uh, but that's interesting sure so okay uh, some YouTube links there and I don't know maybe she's feeling tired now a lot of steps, but we've got one chapter left. How to make photogenic photos. <laughs> so for uh, SNS, for social media, how to take photos. So there's some basic steps in here about photography of kits. So for lighting, for example, okay, here lighting is good, not good here where the kit is dark and you can't really, the background is lit, but the kit is dark. Um, just the pose, yeah, just checking your pose. If it's like a nice dynamic stance rather than kind of a derpy stance, it's all kind of things you normally see. Uh, the angle of the pose, taking it from a, a downward angle or upward angle, obviously from like a straight on or a little bit upward angle is going to make it look larger and make it look kind of more intimidating. So like for big mecha robots and stuff, it's usually a good look. And then making a light booth very easily. Um, this is something that you can do in a many, many, many different ways. This is just one recommended way using like this sort of just like container or storage box and like a flashlight or something and making a very simple light booth for taking photos of your stuff so it can work very well especially if you're working with small scale stuff it's a little bit harder to take uh, to make your own light booth uh, big enough for taking pictures of larger things like anything like a large master grade or PGE or just like a larger diorama you have to make something a little bit larger but for small things it's pretty simple to make that so otherwise of course you can take pictures of things outside so taking your weathered truck out into some foliage or your little uh, done board dude outside 
So there you go. Here's some more YouTube links. And that's the end here then. It's welcome to my room. So we got a little room tour here at the end. I spy a Marita Cruz figure up there. So I approve of that. So just showing off her workspace here. She's got her paint booth uh, or drying booth there. Some people use that. And a <laughs> over here, if you guys have seen my video on this, I've done a video on this as well. I did it slightly differently, but basically the same thing where you just cut the box in order to uh, store your kits easily. You know, if you ha built the kit and you want to keep the box, but then like the box is huge and it's just basically taking up a ton of space, you can cut the box down, uh, use a stapler, resize it to just make the box smaller and fit your kit nicer. It just doesn't take up quite as much space. So yeah, I've made a video doing this exact same thing, essentially. And then this here at the end is an interview with a guy who I guess was a former Hasegawa instructor. I don't know exactly what that means, but basically someone who formerly worked with Hasegawa, I guess, is what it is. So there's an interview here between the two of them. Again, just it's all in Japanese, but there you go. Uh, let's just get to the end here. Here's a map of some, and I don't know if what this is. It's like the translation on this I checked is like production places uh, but I think these are just like a couple of some different shops or something basically and finally at the end some photos of Kosaka Kino out in a park and a couple of the kits that were made for the book and some little handwritten notes here and a little thing there with some links to our YouTube Twitter and Instagram I'll obviously put a link to our YouTube channel down in the video description uh, and if you guys want to check out this book, I think it's very nice. It's a really cool book for beginners. But I do feel a little bit bad sometimes making these videos because uh, I feel like making a video going through showing you guys the entire book sort of disincentivizes you guys from actually buying the book because now you've seen the whole thing, right? But I would highly recommend you guys, if you like the book, if you think it looks cool, definitely go out and buy one for yourself. I honestly just love having these books just because I like having the actual book, having being able to actually hold it in my hands and flip through it. So if you guys do like it or if you think that it looks nice, if you think it looks interesting, definitely. Uh, find the book online and get one for yourself. Then you guys can check out uh, Kosaka Kino's YouTube channel. I'll put the link to that down below. She's on Twitter and Instagram as well, so you can check out all of her works. And if you guys would like to see tutorials, I mean, I, like I said, a lot of this stuff in this book I have covered in different videos in the past, but if there's anything in here that you guys would like to see me cover more in a future, just like short, quick tutorial or something like that, definitely let me know or anything else you guys find online. Maybe not something from this book, but something you come across online you would like to see me give it a try in a video uh, and like kind of share my results with you guys. Let me know in the comment section and I will, you know, add that to my to-do list for you guys. But that's gonna be it for today, guys. Of course, big thank you to Essa Gundam Store for making these videos possible. You can check the link to Essa Gundam Store as well in the video description and check out some different model kits and everything that we've got in stock there. Coupon code will be there for you guys to use as well. And finally, just thank you guys so much for checking out the video today. Liking the video, commenting, subscribing is greatly appreciated if you feel so inclined. And until next time, hope you're all having a great day. I'll see y'all later. Bye guys.